and begin. Great. Well, welcome. Welcome to No Going Back, The Killing of George Floyd. With Judge Lodoris Cordell, the former police auditor of the city of San Jose, a retired Superior Court judge in California, and a longtime advocate for change in police practices in the Afri African American and other communities. And also, Tony Williams, a community activist from Minneapolis, a community engagement specialist at the Science Museum of Minnesota, a rapper, a writer, and very important to us, and a 2015 graduate of Santa Clara University, where Tony in his senior year was the winner of the Markula Prize given to the outstanding student manifesting a commitment to ethics in his life and in his studies. Very special welcome to you, Judge Cordell, and to Tony. Thank you Thank so, you. so much for being here. Happy Thank to you be for here. putting Thanks on this program. Yeah. Thank you. I'm David DeCoste, the Director of Religious and Catholic Ethics at the Markula Center for Applied Ethics at Santa Clara University, the Jesuit <laughs> University in Silicon Valley. Welcome to you all. Please take note of the comments possibility on the chat box on YouTube where you can post questions and we'll try to get as many questions to Judge Cordell and to Tony Williams as we can. A very brief recap of why we're here. On May 25th, Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin killed George Floyd by kneeling on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds as Floyd was restrained by other Minneapolis police officers. And as Mr. Floyd said, I can't breathe. African Americans are four times as likely as white Americans to die while in police custody or being arrested. The killing of Mr. Floyd joins with the killings of other African Americans in the last years and last months that have been captured on video and have burned in the national conscience. I take a moment to recall some of those names, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Eric Gardner, and Philando Castile of St. Paul, Minnesota. And I regret in this moment not being able to mention the other names. So we're here today in a very powerful national moment, a moment many communities have been telling us is not new to them if it's new, bracingly new to many others in this country. So I'd like to start with our really wonderful panel. Again, so grateful you're here and just ask, how have you both been doing during these tumultuous times in the last weeks and months between the killing, the killings, the pandemic? And Judge Cordell, if I might start with you. Sure. Uh, my maternal great grandmother was a slave and survived slavery. My grandmother was the help. My mother survived Jim Crow. And my generation, and I have been part of the civil rights movement up until today. So I am tired. Um, I am also, as well as tired, um, I'm also. Um, believe that this country is at a tipping point where things have never been where they have been before. And because of that, I am ever hopeful. Uh, I am tired of reform uh, because what reform means is to take something and just kind of change its form. I'm not interested in doing that. Uh, so where we can talk more about it during this discussion about where I think how we're moving, about how we should move forward and how we are moving forward. So let's just say right now I'm ever hopeful and uh, that this will culminate in something that we've never seen before in a very positive way. Thank you so much. And Tony Williams, how, how have you been doing the last weeks? Well, I want to echo up much of what the judge said, actually. Um, I think um, I'm tired primarily. Um, again, my grandfather was a court referee born in the prosperous middle class black neighborhood of Rondo in St. Paul. Um, which was demolished by the construction of Interstate 94 um, in the 1950s. Um, my father was a um, mixed man born in 1960 out of wedlock to a black father and a white mother. Um, and um, I myself have been 
waging this war against police brutality now, um, really since my senior year of college when Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri, um, and have been deeply, deeply involved here in Minneapolis. Um, during the Jamar Clark, the response to the Jamar Clark murder, during the response to the Philando Castile murder, during the response to the Justine DeMond murder, and now to the um, response to the George Floyd murder. Um, and so I wish I could say I was surprised by any of this. Um, I wish I could say that um, this felt new to me. Um, I do think that what the judge said about us being in a tipping point is correct. Um, and those of us who have been waging this war um, for the last half decade as for me or for much longer as for the judge, I think um, are trying to um, take as much tactical advantage of the moment as we can um, in order to move things in a transformative direction rather than continuing this cycle that we've seen so many times. So I'm tired, very tired. A lot of interviews, a lot of discussion with policymakers, a lot of work with other organizers. Thank you. And if you will, if you could also start in a perhaps a very hard place, but I, I wanted to ask each of you like what you thought and felt as you watched the video of Mr. Floyd's killing. I didn't watch the video um, and don't watch the videos anymore. Um, I don't feel as though I need to, to understand the context of what's happening. Um, and at this point I have personal and generational trauma around seeing black death so publicly. Um, I understand that it's important for this to be documented and especially for white America, not to be able to run away from the truth of what happened here. I mean, even if you look at the police federation in Minneapolis's statement about what happened that led to George Floyd's murder, um, it was completely inaccurate. It um, stated multiple times that George Floyd was the one who escalated the situation and that the officers were merely restraining him. Um, and if we hadn't had that video, then there's no way that the uprising which has taken place across the entire country over the last two weeks would have happened. So I'm grateful for the existence of that video and also mindful that I don't need to see that video to understand what happened there um, and to fight for justice on, on George Floyd's behalf and on behalf of all of our black martyrs behalf. So let, let me just follow up if I can. Um, yes. I have watched the video and I think one of the heroes or heroines is the bystander who took, had the cell phone and got the footage. But let me tell you what's, what, what did it for me um, was the nonchalance of the officers, but primarily the one with the knee on Mr. Floyd's neck, the nonchalance where he actually looked up at the camera. So he knew that he was being recorded and after that even pressed his knee harder into Mr. Floyd's neck. And what that said to me was this culture that is within policing is so egregious that this person could look up at a, at a camera, know that he was being filmed and still go right ahead with the murder. And the reason being that he knew that he would not face any consequences. That is the culture, part of the culture, and the, the tragic, deadly part of the culture of policing. So at least in that department, that's what this officer clearly believed. So if nothing else people get from that, understand that significance of someone who says, I don't care if I'm being taped, I don't care and I know things can go viral, it doesn't matter. I'm going to do this murder anyway. That was horrifying. I think to add on to that also like the, I think for me, the remarkability, the remarkable nature of this video um, or of just this case in general is to, we live in a post Eric Garner America, right? We live in an, an America where everybody knows what I can't breathe means, right? And where many of us did watch the video of Eric Garner being suffocated and to be aware of your positionality within that system and to hear those words and decide to continue um, with choking someone to death um, is, is egregious. It's egregious. Tony, I'm wondering if you could walk us through as a longtime Minneapolis resident, the, the context of Mr. Floyd's death in itself, the neighborhood there, 
the preceding killings um, of African-Americans by police to which you referred a few moments ago, kind of the context in which this came up that gave rise to such an outpouring in Minneapolis. Certainly. Well, I'll speak to I'll speak to two separate um, varieties of context, right? There's the historical context and then there's my personal context. Um, and in terms of the historical context, I actually helped put together a report called MPD 150 back in 2017. Um, that was a review of the sequicentennial, the 150th anniversary of the establishment of the Minneapolis Police Department. And in that report, um, there were three major sections. There was a past section, which was the first independent history of the Minneapolis Police Department that had ever been assembled. The present section, which interviewed dozens of community members uh, about their experiences with the police today. And the future section, which actually called for the abolition of the Minneapolis Police Department and the creation of a police-free Minneapolis. Um, a lot of discussion in that section as well of what that actually might look like and um, what services and potential alternatives there could be um, to fulfill the roles that law enforcement claims to fulfill um, in our communities on an everyday basis. So when you start looking at that history, I think the most important thing to understand um, is that this, um, this structure, this police department was created 30 years after Dredd and Harriet Scott were imprisoned at Fort Snelling and, um, and after Dredd Scott lost his case to sue for his freedom, right? The department was created five years after um, the U.S. Dakota War of 1860 um, when uh, Lincoln commissioned the hanging of 38 uh, Dakota men um, and forced the Dakota people from Minneapolis or from Minnesota. Um, and it came only two years after the end of the Civil War. So that's the context that this, di this direct department was established in. So when you start looking at the way that that context plays out over the course of history, you really see this cyclical failure of police reform. And what happens, um, and, it, and this is not a pattern unique to Minneapolis by, um, by any measure, but I think it's a useful one to understand the context here. What happens is you have an atrocity perpetuated by the police against the community. And that sometimes is um, you know, as small as low level harassment and sometimes is as big as international news and a, a egregious murder, right? But it's almost always against a black or a native person, right? And so you see the atrocity happen. And then what you see happen in response to that is the community protests and the community shows its outrage. And that um, the vast majority of the time happens peacefully, right? In, um, in rallies and community meetings. Um, and in a couple notable occasions has resulted in an uprising or an insurrection um, where property is destroyed, sometimes people are hurt. Um, and there's just a, a general um, level of intensity that's above um, the median. Um, and then in response to that, local elected officials and criminal justice system folks um, propose ameliorative reforms, right? And those reforms um, are universally um, either completely ineffective from the beginning because they don't address the root causes of the atrocity that happened, or they are opposed by, resisted by, and ultimately undone um, by the police union and by police advocates. And then in response to that, we see the communities fewer die down in response to those reforms. We experience stagnation and backsliding and the conditions um, become immediately returned to the beginning of the cycle um, until the next atrocity happens, usually a few years later. Um, so it's a, it's, an, it's a cycle that we keep seeing and no matter what the reforms are that have been proposed, whether it's body cameras or de-escalation training or officer diversity um, or use of force policy, um, we don't see a fundamental shift in the problems, right? And I can speak to that on a personal level, right? I mean, when I came back to Minneapolis in 2015 after graduating from Santa Clara, um, I was pretty immediately, I mean, within six months, I was doing organizing in the black community here and was thrown into the murder of Jamar Clark and the occupation of the fourth precinct, um, which was 18 days long here in Minneapolis. And at the time I was pretty squarely a police reformist. Um, I genuinely believed that reform was the path forward, that abolition was a pipe dream. Um, and impossible and not even worth um, indulging in conversation. And I saw how much community effort was put into that occupation and that protest of Mr. Clark's death um, and how little came of it. The officers weren't charged. Um, the Minneapolis Police Department instituted a body cameras policy, which ultimately didn't prevent any brutality or future killings. Um, 
at the time, immediately after Jamar Clark's death, the Minneapolis Police Department was actually looked to as a national model for community policing and was propped up by President Obama's uh, Department of Justice as an example of how successful police reform can be when led by folks. And at the time we had a queer, um, queer woman chief of color um, who was seen as one of the top reformer chiefs in the country. And then after J Justine DeMond was killed, um, she was replaced with our current chief, Madaria Arredondo, who's the first black man to lead the department. Um, and my guess is his, his days in that position are numbered as well. We've had different mayors, we've had different city councils and ultimately none of these things have changed. So I think for a lot of us here on the ground in Minneapolis with that historical context, as well as the more recent personal context of having fought for Jamar Clark, having fought for Philando Castile, having fought for Justine DeMond and now fighting for George Floyd, we're fed up. Um, and it's immensely clear to us that the promises that politicians have given us in the past about how the system is fixable, about how they're deeply dedicated to moving forward past a culture of systemic racism, um, they're not capable of, um, of cashing the checks they're writing. Um, and so we need to be looking bigger and broader than that. And that's the work that I've been doing over the last three or four years. Thank you, Tony. And I'm wondering, I'd love to get back to that in more depth in just a moment, but I also wanted to ask Judge Cordell, you know, from your longtime experience as police auditor, in, in, a, in a way like being the, the head of the Civilian Complaint Review Board in San Jose, could you walk us through how you would approach the killing of Mr. Floyd in terms of possible charges, in terms of procedures, in terms of police culture? Where would you have taken that had you been in that position in Minneapolis? So uh, my way of answering that is to say, to let people know there are three separate mechanisms today that go into effect when an officer involved killing like this happens. And it can be something that doesn't even end in a killing, but there are three separate systems. So one system is the police administrative system where the police department, usually its internal affairs unit will do its own investigation. It's where the police are policing themselves. And a determination is made finally by the chief as to whether or not an officer or officer should be disciplined. So that's one, that's the administrative part within the police department. The second thing that happens when there's an in incident like this is the criminal system either gets involved or doesn't. And that uh, falls into the lap of the district attorney. So the district attorney has the power and the authority to look at what happened, conduct an investigation separate from the administrative one done by the police and to make a determination as to whether or not any charges should be filed against any of the officers who were involved in the incident. Then there's a third system, and that is the civil system, where those who have been injured or the families of those who've been killed sue police departments, sue the cities uh, to get reparations in terms of usually monetary damages. So you have and in the civil system, that system is controlled by laws and rules that have come down from the courts. So for example, the courts, the US Supreme Court made a major decision several years ago that talked about what is excessive force? How, how does a jury, what are the jury instructions that should be given when an officer is being sued or a police department is being sued for the use of excessive force? The courts have always sided more with law enforcement than with community. So an example is in defining excessive force, the US Supreme Court has said, you must look at it from the viewpoint of the officer. At that moment, what would a reasonable, quote unquote, reasonable officer have done in that situation? The decision does not permit evidence of what led up to the event, what actions the officers took to perhaps provoke the activity, none of that comes into the definition that has come down from the Supreme Court. So we have the legal system, the courts, defining things like excessive force. We have the criminal system where the district attorney who usually works hand in hand with the police, deciding whether or not charges should be filed and if so, what charges, and then responsible for trying the case. And then you have the administrative system where the police are doing their own investigation 
to determine if officers should be disciplined. That those three things are in effect everywhere in this country. And understand there's 18,000 police departments in this country. They each have their own turf, they each have their own set of rules, and they all are at some point involved in either administrative, criminal, or civil aspects of uh, when these kinds of incidents happen. Judge Cordell, if I could ask, um, mention a number of things there. And uh, it, last year, California passed a new law, adopted a new law regarding police use of force. And the law moved, California law at least, from what I understand to be the reasonableness standard to which you referred, a police officer having a reasonable fear would be justified in using deadly force to a necessary standard. So use of force would only be justified if it's necessary on uh, non-deadly uses of forces having been tried or considered and not deployed. Do you think that law as it's now been adopted is effective, a good change, a possible model for police and other states around the country? Well, if, if you believe that, the police system that we have now, all the departments will always remain the same. And certainly, yes, it's a good thing that we've now moved to a standard that says, was it necessary? Because that means you can look at the circumstances that led up to the use of force. So that puts a heavier burden on police. Um, I, however, have a view that even with that standard, we're still going to have, in my view, these kinds of incidents happening. So it's nice after the fact, uh, but will it be a deterrent uh, when, when cameras that are right in front of officers don't deter them? I doubt it. So yes, it's a good move, but I think much, much more needs to be done. Tony, do you have any thoughts on the change uh, from the, the use of force standard from reasonable to necessary? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, number one, I think like the judge said, it's important to understand that um, that is a, that's a, from what I understand, a policy consideration, not a criminal consideration because the Supreme Court precedents are the ones that establish the reasonable um, standard from a criminal jurisdictional standpoint. Um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong on that judge, is that right? Well, the, the, the decision from the court dealt with civil liability. So when an okay. officer is being sued, the standard is, here's how you jurors decide ex whether or not it was excessive force. What was the office, what did the officer know at that moment and only at that moment? Yeah. Um, so um, again, I would say um, that, yeah, I would agree with the judge. Um, I. I honestly think it's a waste of time. Like if I'm gonna be real honest, a waste of time in political capital, I think it's certainly better to have in place than not to have in place. But I think like the judge said, um, I think it's part of this broader idea that we somehow deter violence by instituting stricter punishments for it, um, rather than preventing it from happening in the first place by changing the societal conditions it emerges in. And that's not just true for policing, but it certainly is true in policing. I mean, I think people have this idea that if we can prosecute police officers effectively for the times that they kill people, then police will stop killing people. And that's just not how police culture works. Um, but I think it's true of community too, right? As a police abolitionist, I firmly believe that, um, you know, policing is not a good response to violence in our communities, right? Policing doesn't prevent violence in our communities. Most of the time, police show up after the crime has already been committed and try to create some sort of sense of responsibility for what's happened. Um, but if we want to prevent violence more broadly, then we have to change the underlying conditions. And on a societal level, that means we need to invest back into our communities. Um, that means we need to make sure that our communities are well resourced because we know that crime is one of the, um, the most key antecedents um, to um, to violence in our communities, right? Um, and so when we look at these things, right, I think the question is less, is this a good idea or not? And more, does it change the overall math? And I've been telling people for a long time, right? If, if, the, if the equation that you have is a societally um, engendered fear of black people, plus police officers that are legally empowered to kill anyone that they reasonably fear, then what you're gonna see is black death. And so if you want to change that equation, if you wanna change the, the output of that equation, you have to change one of the inputs. And changing our societal conception of black folks is 
such a massive centuries long project that we're in the middle of undertaking that we can't expect that to do any of the heavy lifting here. And so what we need to look at is the police willingness um, to kill people that they fear. And I don't think that that policy in particular um, does much to undo that reality. To follow up with I, maybe a painful question to ask, but I think it has to be asked in light of um, the levels at which it's been raised. In the last couple of weeks, um, the National Security Advisor O'Brien and then Attorney General Barr last weekend both disputed the notion that there's systemic racism in law enforcement in the United States. Both opted instead that we're dealing with a few bad apples argument here. Um, Officer Chauvin was just a bad apple. How would each of you respond to that argument? I mean, they know better. They are saying this yeah. because that's what, you know, 45 in the White House wants to hear. That they, I mean, if they believe that they are hallucinatory, they're on drugs because anyone with any good common sense knows that systemic racism is in policing. It's in that systemic means everywhere. And it is everywhere. It is a virus that is absolutely everywhere and has had 401 years to infect everything and everybody in this country. So the, the bad apples argument is ridiculous. Um, are there people in various institutions? Are there bad judges? Are there bad lawyers? Are there bad doctors? Of course there are, yes. Uh, in policing, to, first of all, just to equate bad apples in policing with those other things is not a good analogy because the quote unquote bad apples have weapons, they have badges and they have the authority to put their hands on you without your permission. And if we talk about bad apples in policing, I think what I talk about and what I mean by that are there people who are, have themselves have the virus of racism and we know with the COVID, uh, many, many people are asymptomatic. That is, they have it, but they don't know they have it. And the same is true with systemic racism. So in the police departments, I've heard people say, I don't see color. Well, that's ridiculous. Or, you know, I have lots of friends who are black and brown. That may be true. But the point is racism is so, so deeply ingrained that you, it's a virus that is in many people and especially in policing, asymptomatic. You have it and you don't know you have it until your actions show. And that's what happened with regard to Mr. Floyd. So the argument or just the contention that policing is devoid of systemic racism would mean policing is on an island because every institution, be it banking, be it the media, be it sports, all, all have this systemic racism virus. Thank you. And Tony, I don't, do you wish to add anything? Um, sure. Yeah. I'll start out by saying that the president and almost the entirety of his staff are pathological liars and should never be trusted when they say anything. Um, and I'll continue on um, from that point by saying, um, well, a couple things, right? Um, I have a personal anecdote and a systemic level one. Um, the, I'll start with the systemic one. Um, the um, head of the Minneapolis Police Union, Bob Kroll, um, is openly regarded as a white supremacist here in Minneapolis. He's been known to wear a white supremacist group badge on his uh, biker vest. Um, he called Black Lives Matter um, terrorists at one point a few years ago and has refused to apologize for that remark. Um, in 2007, the current Minneapolis police chief who's black named him in a lawsuit, uh, alleging that he's one of the worst uh, officers of the department in a department with a culture of white supremacy. He was reelected in 2017 by a vote of 423 to 184 officers. So if we don't, if it's a problem of a few bad apples, then we're talking about at least 423 bad apples and 184 good apples. Now, I don't even, I'm not even willing to extend the benefit of the doubt to those 184 officers. I think that there are potentially a lot of people who would have issues with him being the president. Um, for reasons other than his blatant racism. Um, but I do just wanna say that that's indicative of the rank and file culture of the department here in Minneapolis um, and the problems that we've seen. Um, on a personal level, again, like I said, I was a police reformist before I was a police abolitionist. Um, and I brought my, my mom, who's um, you know a pretty progressive middle-aged white woman um, to the fourth precinct occupation um, in 2015. And um, 
people were screaming at the police and she was pretty uncomfortable with that. Um, and so she said, why don't we just go talk to them? You know, hasn't anybody tried to speak to them about what's going on? And I said, sure, mom, let's go talk to them. Let's, let's go right up. And she was like, really? And I was like, yeah, I mean, they're standing right there. Let's go have a chat with them. The two of us walked up to the front of the line um, and there was an officer standing there. And my mom said, hey, I, you know, as, a, as another white person, I'd love to talk to you. Um, this was a lieutenant. It was, a, was um, a higher up official in the police department and said, I'd love to talk to you about racism and bias. And he said, oh, there's no racism or bias in our police department. My mom, you know, was like, well, of course there is. There's bias everywhere in our society. Um, and he said, not in our police department. I don't see color. I'm, I'm incredibly, I treat everybody with respect. And she was like, well, that's just not possible. Like we all have biases. We all see the world in different ways. And he was like, look, my high school elected a black man homecoming king and I voted for him. He was a great guy, you know? And, you know, if I, why would I do that if I was racist? And then he told me a story about a time when um, he had gone to the scene of a car accident and there was a man who had a bucket of fried chicken in his passenger seat and he had to go to the hospital. So he said, you know, I'm not gonna eat that chicken. Do you wanna take it? And the officer said, sure, I'll take it. And he took it and he said to us at a protest, he brought it to a homeless black man who was nearby. And that man was incredibly grateful for that bucket of fried chicken. And isn't that just a sign of how willing he is to support people of color and how unracist he is? And this is again, like a ranking official within the police department. So again, I think, um, I think the few bad apples argument is totally ridiculous. It's ahistorical. Um, it, it refuses to engage with the incredibly robust body of social science literature on the topic. Um, and it ignores the lived experiences of people on the ground, people of color on the ground. Thank you. I know it was a hard question and all. And earlier, though, both of you um, sort of mentioned in, I don't want to attribute hope, but you said you think this is a tipping point we've reached. And I wonder if we could return to that for a moment and then kind of um, move into some of the structural questions that Tony's already um, alluded to a bit more. Why is it a tipping point now? and it hasn't been before. What is it about now that you think has captured people in a way the previous incidents did not? Judge Cordell? Sure, I think there are probably three things. One is the COVID, uh, which has caused, caused us to shelter in place and just put a great pall over this country, over the world. Secondly, is the lack of leadership uh, and the racism coming out of the White House and the swamp that's around it. Uh, and the third is the murder of George Floyd. And it's the time that it took for the officer to finally take his knee off of Mr. Floyd's neck. The time, the eight minutes, 46 seconds where we watched, that's a long time to kill somebody with officers participating and being complicit. So I think the combination of those three things have put, brought us to a place we've never been in this country. And the other, the reason, another reason I think that is I look at the optics. When I look at the people who are participating out on the streets, I have never seen so many white people who have consistently been out on the streets day after day, night after night, which is, says to me, something has changed. People are getting it. And I think the combination, the coming together of these things has brought us to this tipping point where we are now doing things, which, which leads me to Tony and what's just happened in Minneapolis with the police, because if what has happened there has, hasn't happened in my view anywhere else in the country. But I think that's the further indication that we're now moving forward like we have never done before. Thank I would you. agree with that. Tony, um, please, yes. Yeah, and I would say that um, I would also add the historical context as a really important part um, to the three points that the judge raised. Um, I think on a local level, right, you have to remember that Minneapolis has been the subject to five or six high profile police killings in the last five years, right? The people who are protesting now have been protesting for a half decade straight about these issues, right? And the circle just keeps growing, right? I mean, I have 
yoga moms on my Facebook and white cousins who live in the suburbs who are showing up and demanding that the police department be abolished, right? I mean, the, the network of people who are caring about this issue just keeps expanding every time that this happens here. And I think that's why we reached a tipping point here. I also think that the MPD 150 report I talked about, which again um, is available at mpd150.com, I'd highly uh, encourage anybody watching to check it out. I think it's a really powerful document. Um, really, I think drew the connections between this moment and all of the historical moments that have come before it, right? And that again, this is a cycle and that we need to break out of that cycle if we wanna see real change. And then I think again, there's the symmetry of this with the Eric Garner incident, right? And the fact that the country has been protesting this and has been fighting this for five years. And it's it's even started to fall out of the mainstream before two weeks ago because people are becoming inured to the repetition of it. And I think that combined with the things that the judge mentioned is really what's um, really what's making this a tipping point. And I do believe it's a tipping point. Um, I think that um, people are beginning to see that police reform has been incapable of meeting the needs of our communities and that police are actually a pretty archaic and outdated structure to achieve public safety with. And that if we want something that is efficient, effective, fiscally responsible and just, um, we need to create a new system for public safety. Um, and we're certainly in the work of doing that here again, for those who haven't heard our veto proof majority of our city council announced their intentions um, to defund um, and dismantle the police department yesterday afternoon here in Minneapolis. Tony and Judge Cordell, I wonder if you might both um, kind of walk us through and um, help us understand uh, this, say the distinction between that you uh, spoke to earlier, Tony, police reform, what that involves, body cameras, other matters, uh, community policing, um, de-escalation tactics, and police abolition or defunding the police these terms that I think are really new for so many people in the country and what exactly they mean. So what does reform mean? What, is, what does defunding mean? And, and Tony, it sounds like you're really strongly saying we have to move to abolition defunding. Yes. Yes. And so, Judge Cordell, I don't want to presume where you go on that, but would love to hear well, your thoughts on yeah. that. Yeah, so let so, me, and I think this will be a good lead in for Tony. Um, there are two things that are happening right now. Uh, one is reform. And the other is reimagining. So I think both are important to be happening now. So reform basically says, look at the structures, look at the policies we have right now. What can we do to make people safer as long as we have police as it is, policing as it is? So, you know, body cameras and basically making policing more transparent releasing information about police officer discipline, uh, releasing information about police officer lateral transfers. And what that means, an officer gets booted out of one police department because he or she has misbehaved and they immediately go to another police department, make a lateral transfer and that uh, officer gets taken in and is back out on the streets. So there is, especially particularly in California, there is no, very little, if any, transparency in policing. So reform is passing laws that make policing more transparent. But again, that keeps the basic form. Does that stop the killings? Does that stop uh, excessive use of force? No. So the second thing that's happening, so it is important that those reforms, that continues. We absolutely wanna do all we can to keep those kinds of things at bay and to bring more transparency. Then I believe the other thing that's happening is reimagining policing. I've been talking about it for a few years that we need to think outside the box and reimagine what policing should really be all about. Um, you know, we've thrown around the word community policing. It has come to mean pretty much not much. I have always meant it to mean that officers, are, if you keep policing as it is, they're out of their cars all day and they are walking the streets and they know everybody in the neighborhood by name, the people know them and they are, they, we, in that process, you get to kind of break down stereotypes. And that is, hasn't actually happened, really happened uh, that, that I've been able to see. So the, the question is, how, how do we reimagine it? And that's what I think is happening in Minneapolis where they're saying, you know, 
we think we need to take that structure down and we need to look at another way of keeping people safe and at the same time having being able to have police authority so that people can be protected. So that's, I'm gonna stop there and, and leave it to Tony to talk about what's happening in Minneapolis. Yeah, I think, um, I, I certainly agree with some of that. Um, I think that um, ultimately what we have seen um, is that again, reform is about um, shuffling around the deck chairs, right? It's about, let's try to change the culture of these departments. It's a um, sort of standard way of looking at the way that this happens. But what a lot of people forget is that there were actually slavery reformists. Um, the slavery reform movement was massive in the United States. And people said, well, the problem isn't that black people are enslaved, right? The problem is that um, slaves are treated badly, for example, that they're whipped as often as they are, or that um, slavers have the authority to shoot their slaves, right? And, um, and Frederick Douglass was actually, has an incredible quote that I don't have right in front of me, but talks about the, the atrocity of slavery is slavery itself, not its excesses. And I feel that way about policing. Um, I think that, um, again, police perpetrate all these atrocities across the community, but even the everyday functioning of policing is racist and, um, and unethical. Right. I mean, when you look at the way that um, police treat drug users, right, instead of offering them help, throwing them into a system of mass incarceration that um, only creates more problems for them over the course of their life. Um, when it treats sex workers, both people who have been trafficked and people who are choosing sex work, um, not helping them to get access to the resources that they need, which are often the reason that they're doing sex work in the first place but instead either criminalizing them or criminalizing their clients and making it more difficult for them to get access to the resources they need. Um, when you look at how they respond to mental health crises, right? You know, if a black mother with a history of trauma in North Minneapolis um, needs access to mental health resources and doesn't have health insurance, the only place she can call is 911 and she's gonna get a paramilitary official who doesn't live in her community, who's a white guy with a gun and the legal authority to kill her if you feel scared of her. And so I think that like the, it's, when we talk about abolition, what we talk about is changing that underlying math. We talk about saying, actually, you know, who should be responding to that call is a trained mental health professional and somebody who has a relationship built inside that community or one of her neighbors or one of her family members um, who actually knows what she needs and is in relationship with her. Um, and we're talking about a more specialized response, you know, somebody who went to school in the Silicon Valley, it's always amazed me that people thought taxis weren't efficient enough. So we had to create three or four separate ride sharing apps to try and improve on the efficiencies there. But people can't look at policing, which is a one size fits all approach to public safety and say that we need more innovation or a reinvention of the model. Um, and yeah. Could I ask, so when you're saying these things, because I think this is perhaps confusing to others, a little confusing to myself, are you proposing that say substantial funds just taken out of the police department reallocated to a kind of a reimagined regime, for instance, involving mental health workers responding in all sorts of ways with, to which now are responded, police, police officers are responding. And then what about um, sort of a more specific public safety dimension? So let's talk about genuinely violent people um, who, like, how do you envision a reimagined public safety um, unit having a capacity to address those sorts of concerns that people have and aren't crazy to have them? Yeah, of course. Um, well, I think I just want to be clear. I do not imagine the disbanding of the police department and then a creation of another police department that is a better police department. That is a thing that people have discussed. There's a model in Camden, New Jersey that did that. I'm very uninterested actually in that model. Um, I am more interested in what you described, right? Which is taking a real look at the functions of policing such as they are um, and figuring out other ways to meet nearly all of those needs. Um, in response to your question, particularly about violence, um, there are good resources on our website at mpd150.com that talk about those particular situations and like go more granular into specific things. But the thing that I do wanna say about that is um, I trust somebody with four years of social work training and a year's worth of firearms training to take care of a violent situation or a violent person 
much more than I trust um, a police officer who many times has, you know, six weeks of police academy training and maybe a couple years of associates or bachelor's training in criminology. I think that the, that's not the right way to approach those situations. The fact of the matter, as somebody who um, has trained in martial arts for the last few years, and, and again, police officers, this may surprise a lot of people, but don't have training in martial arts usually, other than a little bit of perfunctory training in the academy. So when they're presented with a threat, their, their only response tools really are a couple of the holds they've learned, their baton, their pepper spray, and their gun. Um, and so things escalate very quickly, right? But if we actually cared about the brutality with which police officers respond to these situations, we would get people who are more dedicated to the sanctity of life in those positions um, and give them a broader array of professional options in order to deal with violent situations. But right now we just throw officers with guns and the legal authority to kill anyone at everything from traffic stops to mental health crises to school shooters. And that's a, that's a flawed approach, a deeply flawed approach. Thank you so much, Tony. Judge Cordell, I'm wondering if you, any response to what Tony said about reform versus defunding, your assessment of those options at this time? Well, Tony has spent a lot more time dealing with these issues than I have. Um, what I do know from my work uh, as the independent police auditor is that there is a culture in policing that has been actually helped along by the law and by the courts. And we have to, th that's just a huge part of the problem. And I'll give you one quick example. Police officers set out every day to, uh, basically they use traffic stops and pedestrian stops to do their work. So they have, and in some departments, they actually have a list of every possible vehicle code violation there is. Everything from having a little bit of smudged dirt on your license plate light to having something dangling from your rear view mirror that maybe is a little too long, anything to make a stop. Now, that, that may seem, okay, you know, there's a violation, but they're called pretext stops. This is a part of the culture. And it isn't, it didn't just come out of policing. The Supreme Court, our courts have said pretext stops are just fine. That means you don't really care about the traffic stop. You don't care about it at all, meaning the traffic violation. It's so minor, but you can use it to find a little bit more something about who's driving the car or who's in the car. So it has come to be utilized as a reason, these pretext stops to stop people of color. And it, oftentimes these stops end up in you know, a disastrous situation. So this culture is just so heavily ingrained in police departments around the country. Uh, my view is that you know, reform you know, I don't want to hear about any more bias training. I don't want to hear about, I, I just, because it doesn't work. It doesn't really get to the underlying, the culture. One of the things helping this culture along are, are police unions. Now I support unions. I've, I've never crossed a picket line. I never will. But as unions around the country have lost really a lot of their power and authority, police unions have gotten stronger and stronger. And they use their power, that is all the money they have, to influence legislators in passing laws that really protect law enforcement to the detriment of community. That's happened in California. Uh, so you have legislators who are afraid to go against the police unions because the police unions might use their money to fund someone to run against them. So you have all of this stuff that is happening that basically has made sure that. The, the, the racism virus has, is able to continue to grow. So I, I, I know that reform right now, sure, let's do whatever we can to rein in officers and to bring transparency, but that is not the answer. It is not the solution. Mm -hmm. So I am still in the process of reimagining, which is why I'm watching Minneapolis very, very carefully to determine you know, where, where I might suggest things might be headed. And maybe it is the Minneapolis model, I don't know. But I'm certainly at a place where, and I've been at this place long before today, that we need to think outside the box and reimagine what it is policing should be about in this country. 
Can I move from that? And you, you spoke, Judge Cordell, in the last few minutes about the police culture. You might take it even more broadly, the culture in which this is all happening. And you also spoke to that earlier, our whole history in this country of slavery and its subsequent iterations. I'm wondering for both of you, what do you think you'd say to people, not in police departments, to all the rest of us out here, in terms of this long culture of racism and white supremacy in this country? If you could say like one thing in terms of education, in terms of ways of being, in terms of norms, what would you want people to think or do um, in response to that history and in response to this problem of police violence? Tony, I wonder if I could ask you first. Read the MPD 150 report. Um, it is, uh, or listen to it, um, it's 40 pages. It's available at mpd150.com. Um, the, uh, there's an audio book there as well that's about 90 minutes long. Um, I think that it's a really good, um, again, it's Minneapolis specific. So it talks a lot about the history, the present and the future here. But I think it's a really good introduction to these ideas. Um, more broadly than that, I would say do your homework, um, especially if you're white, especially if you haven't had a lot of experiences with police. Um, it's, um, there's a lot of context that you're missing. So I would, um, there are books like Alex Vitale's The End of Policing, which is free online right now, um, and a wonderful introduction to the subject. Um, Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Davis is a classic um, and a really incredible work. Um, the 1619 Project, which New York Times Magazine published last year, um, is a really good look into the enduring legacy of slavery. Um, do your homework. There's, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Thank you. Judge Cordell. Sure. Um, knowledge is power. And what people don't have regarding systemic racism in this country, especially white people, is knowledge. So I say to everyone, and there are a lot of young people of color who don't know their history, yep. to know your history. Because once you know it, you cannot be satisfied with the way things are. You just can't. And specifically, I say to, to white people, put, use your bodies, put your bodies in spaces where you see black people, people of color are being threatened. So when you see an interaction going on, you put yourself in that space because it's odds are you're gonna be able to protect that person and be safer just because of what you look like. So there are things we can actively do every day, but the key is once you know what systemic racism is, how it is so infiltrated, and you, you can learn that, just, just know your history. You cannot be silent. Um, you just can't, because if you care at all about your fellow human beings, you will be moved to do something, be it on the micro level, the macro level, um, and understand systemic racism, policing is a part of it. There's an article yesterday in the New York Times about uh, racism in corporate America. And one of the things, I, I'll just read a quote from the story, and it says, when companies are forced to confront racism, the responses are predictable. Here it is. The playbook is issue a statement, get a group of African-American leaders on a conference call, apologize, <laughs> and have your corporate foundation make a contribution to the NAACP and the Urban League. That's, that's it. That's not going to work anymore. Uh, the fact is, in Silicon Valley, where we're all located, um, or, and where Tony was located, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Microsoft, and Amazon, there are zero, zero African-American members of their senior leadership teams. Zero. So everywhere, everywhere, this virus of systemic racism, it's everywhere. Do your part, speak up, and... That's how we're, that's why I know now we're at this tipping point. We're gonna make things different. And to piggyback off of that, I think um, even seeing from afar the change that's happened at SCU in the past few years um, has been really fascinating to me. Um, when I was on campus, we absolutely had a problem with systemic racism, um, misogyny, um, anti-immigrant sentiments, those kinds of things. Um, and I was part of the Unity Four movement my senior year. Um, that helped to propose um, a lot of changes in how the university dealt with those topics. Um, and we have seen some of that change um, play out over the last four years, but I was particularly struck by my senior year, um, the organization 
uh, or I guess the campus planned a protest for Martin Luther King Day in response to police killings of black people um, and was unwilling to call it a Black Lives Matter rally and said it was called an All Lives Matter rally, Justice Matters rally. Um, and that's not where we're at anymore, right? I mean, I saw the statement that went out from the university's president recently, um, you know, publicly declaring that Black Lives Matter and committing to working deeply with the Santa Clara Police Department where the university has a lot of leverage um, to try and undo systemic racism in that department. Um, again, I'm not overly optimistic about working with police departments on their systemic racism because I think in many ways police departments are their systemic racism, um, but it's still encouraging to see institutions like SCU sort of change their tune and take these issues really seriously um, and start, you know, like the judge said, putting their bodies on the line a little bit. Wondering, we've got a, uh, several minutes left. Might talk a little bit about ways you would evaluate and think that religions in the country might be able to play a role in the protests going on. I mean, of course, um, in some ways, the last time we had this much protest uh, in the country, um, under the religious leadership of Martin Luther King Jr., there was a great religious presence um, in those protests. And I'm wondering if each of you might evaluate how you think religions in the country have participated so far in protests and what you'd like to hear from them. Um, Judge Cordell. So the, the Black church was just instrumental in the civil rights movement in the 60s and in the 70s. It was a place where we could be to become energized and to get the courage to go out and deal with the racism out in the streets. Uh, so there's no question that churches uh, can be and have been in the past instrumental in helping bring about change. Uh, and as long as religious institutions can continue to do that, I think that's terrific. What I'm seeing, however, are some religious groups like the evangelical groups who are entirely supportive of the man in the White House and they are supporting doing things to encourage uh, the racist rhetoric and also the racist conduct that's coming out of Washington. So that I find very, very troubling. Uh, and of course, you know, doing a photo op with a Bible uh, and saying, you know, know your second amendment rights uh, is the very blatant attempt to weaponize religion against those who want change in this country and want uh, fairness and want an end to racism. So, I mean, it can be used in a very destructive way um, and in this movement. And I'm just hoping that um, those who are in the religious communities uh, speak up, have some courage and uh, be with those of us who are, are moving and, and getting over this tipping point. Thank you. And Tony, wondering if any thoughts um, on that question about religions in Minneapolis or beyond? Certainly. Um, a couple scattered thoughts, right? I mean, number one is that um, all of the big three monotheistic religions on the planet have a deep investment in this kind of work in different ways, right? Um, Judaism, in many ways, comes out of a tradition of state persecution and state violence, right, um, against a marginalized group of people. It's been weaponized in other ways, um, notably in the Zionist project against um, Palestinian settlements, right, um, and livelihoods. But, um, and that's not to say that, you know, uh, certainly I, I don't have any issues with Jews as a cultural or historical group, but the state of Israel has been incredibly problematic and has used state violence against Palestinian folks frequently. Um, from a Christian perspective, I mean, our, the entire religion is based around a state execution. So there's certainly something there, some deep resonance there um, that is incredibly important. And the state execution of a person who is speaking out against empire, which is what many of the folks on the ground are doing right now in Minneapolis and elsewhere around the world. Um, Islam has a long history of um, liberatory politics as well. Um, particularly, I'm thinking of the long history of revolutionary black Islam in the United States um, and Malcolm X and other folks um, who are deeply committed to that religious tradition and fighting for the equality of black folks. Um, I myself, I grew up in the Christian church and now am some sort of wacky hybrid of Christianity, Taoism, and neo-paganism, um, which we're, we're fresh out of time for me to explain what that all means. And also I'm 26 and trying to figure out what it means to myself. But I will say that I think that um, 
our movement here, especially in Minneapolis, is incredibly, incredibly spiritually grounded. Um, if you watch the city council announcement from yesterday of the veto proof majority committing to disbanding the police department, um, it was an incredibly spiritual occasion. There was a lot of ritual, there was a lot of community um, religious resonance, not necessarily associated, I don't think, with any formalized tradition, but um, it's clear to us right now that the, that the work that we're doing here in Minneapolis and around the world is godly um, and divine, and, um, and I'm proud of us for that, um, and I'm, I'm happy to see it. Well, our time is up, but I, I just want to thank you both so, so much. I, I know you spoke earlier of just being tired and kind of keeping the fight up, and we do not underestimate just the time you've taken to be with us today and are so, so grateful for it. Tony, you mentioned the sort of amalgamam of religion, you're figuring things out. Well, I would say your commitment to justice um, as well as Judge Cordell's commitment to justice are an example that any religion folk need to contemplate and deeply take in in their own formation. So, um, so thank you so much. Um, this has been a uh, live show with Tony Williams from Minneapolis, community activist there in that community, and Judge Ladoris Cordell, the former police auditor of the city of San Jose. I'm David DeCoste from the Markless Center for Applied Ethics at Santa Clara University. This video is being recorded and will be posted shortly on the website of the Markless Center, which you can go to at www.scu.edu backslash ethics. And there will also be other materials there in our ethics spotlight section on the issue of police violence against African Americans in this country. Thank you very much for being with us today. And again, thank you so much to Judge Cordell and Tony Williams. Thank, thank you, David. David. Thank you, Judge Cordell.